Hello, Cup Coders, and welcome to Coding with Mages. Um, real quick, I'm going to explain what this series is all about, what it, what you can expect to see. Uh, this is going to be a series where I'm going to be doing game development. I'm going to be working on small games, nothing large. I'm not going to be doing 3D games or really big RPGs or anything like that. Mostly, you're going to see me doing small Atari-style games. And the reason being, reason that is, is because, well, that's the building blocks of all game development. Uh, you can't, you're not going to build a huge structure like the White House or the Washington Monument without having a foundation. And that's what those games are. By building small games like that, that gives you the foundation that you'll need when you go to build larger games. Now, in this series, we are not going to focus on just one technology. No, we are actually going to focus. We're actually going to look at a couple different technologies. Although we're going to focus mostly between three. <clears throat> And the first technology we're going to look at is Flat Red Ball. It is a game engine slash toolkit that is produced by Victor Shellaroo. Um, he's a really nice guy, and the toolkit is awesome. I've been following it almost since its inception. The second thing we're going to look at is Game Maker. Now we're not going to, and then in addition to that, we're also going to look at X and A. Now we're not going to look at all three of them at the same time. No. What we're going to do is we're going to start work. We're going to build a project first in Flat Red Ball, then in Game Maker, and then we might try to make it in X and A so that you can see the difference. Now, this first project we're doing, we are not doing across all three technologies. Instead, we're only going to be using Flat Red Ball because this first project is a Flat Red Ball tutorial. Once we're done with this, then we're probably going to look into remaking Pong in all three technologies so that you can see the difference. Now, once I've done all three technologies once, then we're going to narrow it down to just two technologies. That would be Flat Red Ball and Game Maker. We're going to kind of skip away from X and A a little bit. Um, reason being is because we don't, you know, why, why build it in X and A when Flat Red Ball is built on top of it? Anyways, so that's said and done. We're going to go ahead and get into the series now. We're going to start with Flat Red Ball. I'm going to start by showing you where to get it. Okay, Go to flatredball.com. That's www.flatredball.com. It'll change the name to news blog or whatever. Come here. Go to the download page. If you have a Windows 8 system, you're going to want to click on this right this link right here and follow the instructions if you're using visual studio 2013 or 2012 you're going to want to click on this and go through those instructions and when you're done with those or if you didn't have to do those then you're going to want to click right here to download the installer once the download installer is downloaded then open it up and run it and pretty much go through the installer it's fairly simple you click next through most of it some of them you click close but that'll install, that'll make sure that you have all the prerequisites. If you don't have DirectX, it'll install it. If you don't have X and A, it will install it. And I'm not 100% sure, but I think it might also install Visual Studio Express if you don't have it. So, with that in mind, there you go. Um, Visual Studio is a requirement for Flat Red Ball. So is X and A and DirectX. But, all right, now we're going to get into today's stuff. Actually, before we do that, let's show you one more thing here. www.gluevault.com. Once you've got Flat Red Ball installed, you'll have something called Glue, which will be your central component that you're going to use to interact with all of Flat Red Ball. Glue Vault will provide you plugins and entities and code files and stuff that you can load up into Glue and just run off and use them. And when I, when you see my Glue you're going to uh, I'm going to point out that I've got a lot of plugins installed on my glue program that you will not have off the get go. This is where you're going to get them. Like there is a chat plugin that allows you to chat with the members on, of Flat Red Ball. Really great. Come join us on the chat, hang out with us, talk with us. You know, if you have a problem, we'll answer your we'll do our best to help you. All right. We're going to work on the tutorial today. I'm not going to be having, pulling the tutorial up on screen. But for you, where you're going to find is you're going to come over here to documentation, click on tutorials, and then click right here where it says beef ball. Now this is the tutorial that we are going to work today. We're going to work sections 1 through 12. 
We're going to do all of these today. We are not going to do the beef ball with networking, uh, mainly because I'm not that great with networking. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if something did go wrong with the networking piece, I would not be able to fix it because I'm, I, it's all foreign to me. I haven't worked with it enough to understand everything that's going on. So we're only going to work 1 through 12. We're going to go through this as fast as possible. I've done this tutorial something like five times now. Um, this is going to actually be my fifth or sixth time. I'm not 100% sure. I'm not going to be pulling the tutorial up on screen because I actually have another computer sitting next to me where I've got the tutorial open. Um, I'm not reading tu the tutorial verbatim either because, like I said, I've been through the tutorial several times so that I could try to make sure that I knew what I was doing. All right, but what I will be doing is I will be scanning through the tutorial to make sure I don't miss any important stuff. And if you miss something, the game might not run. So here we go. First thing you need to do is open your glue, which is what we're looking at right here. Isn't it pretty? So we're going to start a new project. I'm going to go File, New Project. That opens up this project file, Flat Red Ball Project Creator. You see all the different project types over here. We're going to play with the XNA 4.0 for the PC. We're going to name this Beef Ball. And then we're going to click on Make My Project. Now it is going to download the project files from the Flat Red Ball website so that it always makes sure that it has the most recent copy of the project. If we find a bug, we fix it, you want the newest copy. That's it. So when it's done, you're going to click Close. Now I'll close both of those. It'll open this window where you can optionally double click this file to open in Visual Studio. Or what I do, project view in Visual Studio. And that'll open it in Visual Studio too. Now I could have done it either way. I specifically chose to do it this way just to show you that you can. Now I'm going to open it. I don't need it in Visual Studio right now, but I'm going to open in Visual Studio because my Visual Studio takes a little moment to, to boot up. Of course, I just had it open a few minutes ago, so it's a little faster this time. All right. Now, first thing we're going to need is well, we've got our project. We've, we've got everything set up there. This is a runnable game. We can actually run it. But before we do anything, I want to change this. We're going to come change the camera settings to 3D because this is going to be a 3. We, we want to work this as a 3D game. The reason is, is when you change to a 3D coordinate set, it puts 0, 0 at the center of the screen. And that's going to help us later on when it comes time to moving things around. You'll see. For now, we need a player. So we're going to right click here, add entity. And we're going to call this player ball. And this is not a 2D character. So we click OK. Now, the, that player needs to have a body. We need to be able to see it. What does it look like? How, do, how are we going to know where it's at? And right now it's invisible. So we're going to right open it up, go to objects, and right click on add object. We're going to leave it as flat red ball custom type and choose circle. And we're going to call that body. Just like that. Boom. All right. It's got a body. That's right. It has a body. It's a little circle. Okay. And as I'm talking here, I'm scrolling down, making sure that I can see everything. Now, real quick, I'm going to show you the glue view. I don't use, I'm not going to use glue view a whole lot through this tutorial, but I'm going to show it to you real quick right now. We're just going to launch glue view. And this is where we can take a look and see what the, the, the object looks like. And we can do that at any point in this. We can look at any object we want. So we've done new glue view. And that's that. Uh, the next thing, we want a screen because in order for anything to show up on your screen, it has to be on a screen. I, okay, maybe the way I said it doesn't make sense. But you look at it this way. In your game, when you play when, when, any, any game, whatever, the main menu is one screen. The game itself is another screen. The in-game menu is another screen. You're following anything that changes your screen, what you see, ev anything that changes everything you see on your screen is a screen in itself. All right. So our game screen, that's what we're going to create. We're going to create, click, right click, go to add screen and call it game screen. <coughs> this is what we will be using. This is what we will be looking at. This is where all the action is going to take place. Now, we want to put this player on the game screen. Now, I'm going to show you the long way of doing it, and then later I'll show you the short way. First, the long way. Right-click on Objects, Add Object. 
we want to we want to add an existing entity so click on entity grab that player ball leave it as player ball instance and click OK now we have a player ball instance on the game screen so if we were to run it we would be able to see that we have one there now I've got the glue compiler plugin right there so I'm gonna click compile and I'm gonna click run Do, 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 do. There it is. There is our game screen with the player ball on it, but we can't do anything with him right now. So we need to make him movable. We need to get, add some controls to this guy. So we're going to add controlling to keyboard functionality to this guy. Now, the first thing we're going to do, we're going to remap the input. All right. You may not own an Xbox 360 pad, or you may be environment developing where in an environment where you don't have access to one but it can be easily solved by creating a button map to the keyboard now you could easily skip this portion and just code straight to the keyboard but the reason you want to code to the Xbox gamepad and then map the keyboard to it is so that even if your players are playing on a computer they can still plug in a controller to their system and play the game with the controller it doesn't have to be an Xbox gamepad. It could be any computer controller, USB controller pad that has the same number of buttons as the game as the Xbox controller does. Okay? That's why you want to do this. This way it makes it easier for your players. So to do this, we're going to switch over to the code. And anytime there's major changes in glue, it's going to force Visual Studio to reload. So you can that's fine. I'm going to open game one CS. And we're going to come down to initialize. And right in here, we're going to check to see if the gamepad 1 is connected. If it is not, then we're going to create the default button map. And we're going to do this very simply. If flat red ball input, input manager, because it's all in the input manager, Xbox 360 gamepad index 0, which is the first controller, is connected equals false. If that is the tr if that's the case if that, that says hey if the first controller is not connected then we're going to do this dot create default button map so what that will do is that'll that'll map certain keys on the keyboard to the Xbox button so if you don't have a, the Xbox key controller handy you can use the keyboard to play instead nice huh? all right so now we've got that next thing we want to do is want to actually wire this up to our con to our player I mean what's the sense of having the keyboard if you can't wire it right so we're gonna go to the player and entities and right in here we're gonna change this custom activity and we're gonna first write this in bad practice mode and then we're gonna come back and clean it up okay and I'll, we'll, we'll explain it as we go float we're going to movement speed equals 10 and then we're going to use that input manager xbox 360 gamepads index zero control positioned object and we're going to control this object and we're going to make it move to the movement speed now this is bad coding practice all right and there's reason there's several reasons why let me explain first you see all these four functions that, that were already in this file? Uh, the custom initialize, custom activity, custom destroy, and custom load static content. My suggestion, and I believe this would Victor Shalaru would make this suggestion too, is you should never have any game logic in these four functions. Instead, these four functions should only ever have function calls. Now we're going to get to that in a little bit, but before we do, this movement speed is one of those variables that we might change as we're testing the game. So we don't want to have to plop down and go digging through all these source code files to find out where it's at, especially when we have something easier right here. So we're going to go in here to the player ball on the variables. We're going to right click and add a variable. And we're going to create a new variable. It's going to be called a float and it's going to be called movement speed. Oh, check that out. And we're going to set it to 10. Just like it was in the code. Now we can come back to this code. We can remove this here and capitalize this first name because I capitalized it in the other place. Ooh, check that. Isn't that awesome? Nice. Okay, so that ex escalated it. So now if we want to change their movement speed, it's a little bit faster to do so. Right? 
Now, we, next thing we want is we want to be able to con control by multiple, have, provide support for multiple controllers. Sorry, I'm, I'm having a loss of words here. We want to provide support for multiple controllers. So right here in there, we're going to come up here, Xbox 360 Gamepad, M Gamepad. And you notice it puts it private. I always suggest to go ahead, if if you're not making it public or protected, all, go ahead and put private keyword in front of it. I know the compiler sees, you know, if you don't put the private there, the compiler automatically assumes it is private. But for the sake of, you know, it's good coding practice, put it that way, to always put the keywords there, even if they're not required. You don't ever know. The next person who sees your code may not be as experienced in programming, and they'll see that and be like, is this public or private? Well, by putting it there, you're you're solving that whole issue, okay? So, we've got this. This will give us a little bit extra support for that. So, but we also are going to need a player index. So, public integer player, if I can type, index. And this is going to be a property, but we're only going to set the property in gamepad equals to input manager Xbox 360 gamepads value. So this means we're going to call player index with the, I, the the index of the controller. And it's going to set it to this player ball. So only this player ball will be controlled by that. Okay? Now, in its custom initialized, we're going to go ahead and give it a default value. This player index equals zero. You always initialize every value you can. Now, we're going to change the custom activity. So now instead of input manager gamepads blah 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 we're just going to use m gamepad like that boom done deal now as i said earlier we don't want logic in these four functions the custom initialize custom activity custom destroy we don't want logic in these four functions we'd rather have function calls because it makes it easier to read to understand what's going on so we're going to create a new method right down here called private void movement activity and this is where we are going to put this logic right here and we're going to call it right here so that cleans that up a little bit makes it look nicer makes it look easier to read when you get into large projects you're going to have a lot of stuff in custom activity i promise you so by splitting it up like this and having each one doing its own little function when you read through custom activity here you'll have a better understanding of what's going on it won't take you three years to read through it be like oh what does this do the function name should tell should tell the story all right next now we've got that the, if you play the game now the player can go off the screen and go anywhere they want not a good idea we want to keep them on the screen we're going to do this by creating the boundaries of our game field now i haven't explained but beef ball is sort of like air hockey it's got the got the walls all around it then it's got two goals at the end you'll have a puck that you're trying to get into the goal to score so what we're going to do right now is we're going to create the walls around it and we're going to do this in the game screen by creating a new file add new file and we're going to select a shape collection and we're going to call this the collision file. Do, 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 do. Let me catch up on my tutorial here. I've kind of blasted by it. Okay, so now that we've got, got now we're going to open this collision file by double clicking on it. That'll open it in the polygon editor. Now, I'm going to maximize my screen. And you see I've got this little square right here. That square represents where the camera is. So anything outside the square is not on camera. Anything inside the square is on camera. We want to build our game screen right around this, this camera frame. So we're going to start with adding some axis aligned rectangles right there. Now I'm going to zoom out just a little bit more with my thing. I'm going to click here. All right, we're going to move him up to the top. Which, if I remember correctly, was something like 10.5? No. So we're just going to play around with the variables till we get it where we want it to. 16.5. I knew it was a 0.5 somewhere. All right. I don't like the scale factors that it starts with, so I'm just going to change those to 1. And we want to scale this 
on the x factor, which I think is about 22. No, 23. So that's perfect right there. Now, we're going to do this again, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to click up here. I'm going to press Control c to copy it. Now, I'm going to move it to the bottom by putting a negative right here. Now we've got the top and bottom walls. The next thing we need is we're going to have four walls here because remember the goals are going to be right here in the center. We are not creating the goals in this collision file. So now we're going to create another axis line rectangle. And this time, instead of manipulating it by the numbers over here, I'm, going, I'm still going to do that, but I'm going to show you another way of doing this. Now there's keyboard commands. If you look up here, there's move, scale, and rotate. Now move is M. Scale is X, and I believe rotate is R. We're going to, but instead of using the keyboard commands, you can also click here. So I'm going to click here and choose to move it, just like that. And then I want to scale it. So we click on scale. I'm going to click and drag my mouse. All right. So that's how I'm going. To, that's how you can do that. Uh, what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to do it this way because I prefer doing it by the numbers. I'm going to scale that to 7 and this is going to go up to a 10 I think or 10.5. Perfect. Now if I deselect you see that this lines up perfectly right there. That's why I do it by the numbers not because you know I'm just anal. It's because I like I, I like being clean. I like the numbers to be clean so they don't have a whole lot of spaces after the decimal place. It's easier this way too so that when you're manipulating stuff through the code you know you can remember what the numbers are easier. All right now we're going to copy this thing and I'm going to paste it over and over again but each time I'm just going to do like this. Boom. So there's another one. I know that makes a really small thing. Actually let's go ahead and change this. We're going to change this to a 6 and this will have to come to an 11. 11.5 okay so that comes to 11.5 so we're going to do this to here 11.5 and this will become a 6 this way it'll make it a little bit larger of a field so it'll be easier to hit it to all right and we're going to copy that and we're going to move it again copy it and every time i press Control c it's creating a duplicate of it in its place. Now there we go. That's perfect, I think. So we're going to leave it just like that. Now we're going to save this. My save shape collection. It should already have the name, so we'll just click OK and say yes to overwrite. So now we can close this. We have our shape collection. We are good to go on that. Now we just need to add some collisions to that. And we're going to do that. Uh, there we go. We are going to do that over in here. Yeah, we'll go ahead, reload in the game screen all right right here in the game screen we're going to create a new method right here static void collision activity i'm going to put that up here in custom activity i'm going to clean up these blank lines because i don't like them And down here in the collision activity, this is where we're going to actually check for collisions. Now we're going to start with player ball, and I'm going to show you a couple different collisions as we go through this. So we're going to grab player ball instance. Seriously? Stop messing with me. Oh, did I not add the player ball instance to the game screen? Yes, I did. It's right there. All right. Hold up. Yeah, see, I've I've already jumped ahead and missed something here, so we gotta I gotta go back a little bit. Oh yeah, dur. Hold up. So we have that. Did I miss something? No, I got that. I got that saved. All right, just to check, let's make sure it all shows up in the screen. I'm gonna change. This. We're gonna set this right here to start a project. I don't know why it doesn't do it automatically. So we should see, all right, so yes, we see the ball and we see the boundaries. So that's good. So for some reason, this is just not loaded. I think my C-sharp, 
my, my, my intelligence just isn't working right here. I'm not 100% sure. Layer, ball, instance, body, collide against, move. Why is that not showing up? Collide against move, and we're going to collide against the collision file. We're going to have give the player ball instance a mass of zero, and the collision file will get a mass of one. That'll prevent the mass, the collision file from moving, but it'll stop the player file. What are you doing? No, private. That's what it is. Durr. That should not be static. That should have been private. My bad. All right, so there we go. So now if we play it, then the player can go up to the collision file, the, the boundaries essentially, and will be stopped. They will not be allowed to go outside through the collision file. But that's not the way we want it. Let me, let me show you what we're talking about here. So we play it. Boom, it just stops. That's it. It doesn't go any further. So we don't want, we don't really like that. Now I'm going to add real quick in here and this is something that you can do in your games too if you want to right here in the update I'm going to check flat red ball input input manager keyboard hold on Key down, there we go. Keys escape. Flat red ball services game exit. Now this will make it easier. You can do this in your projects too. That just makes it easier to exit out of your test. So now instead of having to hit click on the X, I can always press escape on my keyboard and the game will stop. Like I'm gonna go ahead and play it now. Oh wait. What? Oh, if my bad, <laughs> forgot the if statement. There we go. So press F5. The game starts playing. I hit escape. The game closes. That, that's just some. The tutorial won't tell you that, but that's just my suggestion. So for during testing, but don't forget always to remove it. So I do this to do remove debug code so what that'll do is when you come in here you can always use the to do's to check the task list and you'll see all the to do's here huh okay apparently the devs have some more to do's in here too <laughs> oh well so that, that's done that's just personal preference we're going to go ahead and move on from that so we've got this collision activity going we want to change it so that it it works a little bit better we want the player to bounce off the wall instead of just come to a screeching halt to do that we're going to change this from collide against move to collide against bounce and then collide against bounce takes one more argument which is in elasticity value so we're going to just apply one for the elasticity now if we play it again you'll see that we do actually bounce off the wall See, but we're not bouncing as big as you might expect us to do and that's because of how we're working our controls uh, we're 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 currently adjusting the velocity not the acceleration we would rather be work messing with the acceleration so we're going to go back to player ball and in here instead of changing where is it oh i can't find it man yeah Control position to object acceleration. We're going to change this right here. Acceleration. So now this will just change the acceleration. So if we play it now, watch this. Boing. Now we bounce off. But now I take my hands off the keyboard. You'll notice that the ball just keeps going and going and going. So we need to apply some form of friction or drag that's what it's called in games it's called drag now in the real world it's called friction as two things rub against each other all right so we're going to do that right over in here we're going to add a friction variable to the player and it, the friction variable actually already exists so we're going to leave exposed 
you know, expose an existing variable, and you see it's already got drag selected right there. So we're going to go, we're going to expose that variable, and we're going to set it to 1. Now, if we play the game again, the, b the player ball will slow down just that quick. There wasn't a whole lot more to that. We were quick at doing that. We didn't have to write a ton of code. I mean, this is the great thing about flat red ball is a lot of stuff is already taken care of for you. All right. Now we've got a player. We need the player to be able to do something. So the player needs to, we need a puck. So that's, let's do that. Add an entity. I'm going to add a puck. Once again, this is a 3D object. Now we need to be able to see the puck. So let's add a circle. I'm going to call it the body yet again. Now we need to be able to differentiate the puck from the player. And so what I would like to do is we're going to change the color of the puck to red. And we're going to change the radius of the puck to 0 0.5. So that makes it half the size of the player. Okay, you following along so far? Good. Now we need to add this puck to the game screen. And I told you earlier I'd show you another way of adding entities. Just grab the puck, pull it down, drop it on the game screen. This will come up, just say yes. There it is. We have a new puck instance in the game screen. As I'm scrolling through the tutorial, making sure I didn't miss anything here. All right, now, as we place this, both the player and the puck are at 0, 0 on the game screen. So we're going to come in here, we're going to click on the player ball instance, we're going to change its X value to 10. That'll put him over on the right side of the screen. So if we play it now, compile run you see the player is now over on the right side of the screen and the puck is in the center and that's exactly what we want now we need to be able to collide against the puck with the player we also need the puck to collide against all of the collision files so that's what we're going to do now we're going to come back in here open up your game screens again and now we're going to add First off, let's add the collision between the player and the puck. So we're going to start with a player ball instance. If the player ball's body collides against the puck, we're going to go ahead with collide against bounce. And this is puck instance body. Then you want to bounce it off. The player ball instance is going to have a, a value of 1. I believe I'm just double checking. Yes, the puck, well, we're going to give him a smaller value here. We're going to go 0.3f and elasticity of one. That means when the player hits the puck, it's gonna bounce the puck more than it does the player. Okay, the player will still bounce just slightly, but the puck will bounce a lot more. Now we need to bounce the puck against the collision file. We're gonna do that by starting with the puck instance body, collide against bounce, the collision file, and we don't want the collision file to move, so we're going to give the puck a thing of 0. And we're going to give the collision file a mass of 1 and keep with our 1 elasticity. Now, if you play the game now, you can now bounce the puck off the walls and off the player and all over the place. Fun, fun, fun. But the puck will continue going, just like the player did originally. So once again, we're going to come back up here to the puck. We're going to expose the existing drag variable and set it to 1. The issue we have now is that as much as interesting as the game is, it's not going to be, you know, that fun. You're not playing against anybody. It's just one player bouncing a darn puck around. How, much, how fun can that be? Oh, wait. Wait, back up. I missed something. Make sure I'm not missing everything. There, yeah, see, I just had to compile it correctly. So, bingo. All right, so the next thing we have is we're only, we only have one player, so we need to add more players. Now, to make that easier, instead of having one play, you know, instead of having to manually add another player instance to the game screen, we're going to create a list. All right, so I'm going to click on objects in the game screen, and we're going to add objects. We're going to add a positioned object list. Now, this is a generic list of, of positioned objects. And we're going to specify the type here as the entity's player ball. And we're going to call this the player ball list. 
Okay, so now we have the player ball list. We're going to tape our existing player ball and throw it into the list. So now it's got one more in there. Let's go ahead and grab another player ball and add it to the list as well. But we're going to rename that one because we kind of want them to be the same. Player ball instance 2. Just that easy. Now this is out of order, but I know that we're going to do this later on. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here. The two players are going to look exactly alike. So I'm going stepping out of order slightly, and we're going to expose the color variable on the player ball. I'm going to add variable, tunnel to a variable in a contained object, grab that body, and grab the color. So we've done that. So we've exposed the color variable. So then we come back down here. We can grab this one right here, and let's let's change play let's change player ball instance two is color to can. This way we can tell the difference between player one and player two. Okay. Like I said the tutorial will tell you to do that later, but for now I think we're good. Let me double check, make sure I'm where every where I'm supposed to be. Okay, now we need to modify the collision codes because we've got multiple players now, but we're only one of them is going to respond to the collisions. So we're gonna we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna loop through all of the players. So we're gonna start with that with a for loop for integer i equals zero. That's right. An i is less than player ball list the count, and then we're gonna increment. Both of these, let's throw them in here and move them over a little bit. Now we're not going to use this player ball instance here. Instead, we're going to go with the player ball list on the index of i. That'll still give us the same results, but this time it's checking each individual player ball instance, not just one, and hoping it works for all of them. Now, the next thing we want is we want to be able to bounce the player against the player. So if they happen to collide against each other, we want to be able to detect that. So that's what we're going to do here. Integer j is equal to i plus 1, because you're not going to have to check for the players below. j is less than player ball list count, if I can type. And then we're going to increment j, player ball list i, body collide against bounce player ball list j body and we're going to give it a one 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 what that means is that both of the player balls when they collide against each other are going to bounce each other equally that's why we give them both a one now we have all this. If you play the game, you'll notice that both of the play, both player balls are responding to the same input. We want to change that. So we're going to go over here to player ball CS first. And we're going to remove this right here. We no longer need that. Then we come back to game screens and we're going to add a new function here. Um, assign and custom initialize right up in here. Assign... Uh, Assign player ball indices, indices. I can't pronounce that right. I generally just call it indexes. And then we're going to create the functions down here. Private void. It takes no arguments. And then for each player ball, for integer i equals zero, i is less than player ball list count count i plus plus so we got a nice little for loop that's going to loop through all the player balls that are in the list player ball list i player index equals i so that assigns a new player index to each ball so that not all the balls are going to be the same so if we play it now, you'll notice that you can control player one and player two is not being controlled by the same character. We're good there. Let's go ahead and check it just to be safe. Always check your code as often as you can. Test and test and test. Oh, but do you see one other thing that happened there? Player two is starting in the center of the screen. So let's fix that real quick. While we're at it, 
We're going to come right here, player ball instance 2, grab that x variable, and set it to negative 10. So if we come back here and press F5, player 2 is now on the opposite side from the starting positions. Awesome, isn't it? Yeah, let's push them all off the wall. Right. Now, the next thing, notice I just pushed them out through the goal. We don't want that. We want to be able to get scoring when you go out through the goal. So the next thing we want to do is we want to add a collision file, another collision file. So add, new file. Once again, this is going to be another shape collection. And this one's going to be called goal area file. And we're going to reopen this one. Well, not reopen, but we're going to open it just like we did the other ones and zoom out till you can see, see the window box. Now, to make it easier so we can place it right, let's go ahead and import the other file, the collision file, so we can see where they're at. So this is what we're going to do. Load shape collection, grab that collision file, and insert it. Now, this inserts it into this file that we're working in, which means when we're done, we're going to want to delete this out. But for now, it's just being used as a guide. Now we're going to create an axis rectangle. And once again, you can move this however you want. I just tend to use this right here. Let's fix my scaling factor first. Now, for X, let's go 23. Ooh, how perfect could that be? Now we just need to scale the Y, I think it is. Yep, scale the Y. So we're going to go with 6. 6 is too big. Let's try 5. 5 is too small, so that means it's 5.5. .5. Perfect. Now I want to be able to see the difference, so we're going to change the colors right here. Perfect. Check that out. And now we're going to grab that, copy it, and move it. So now we have two of them. Last thing I want to do to these things is I want to name them. That's what this right down here is for. We're going to name this one left goal. And we're going to name this one over here as the right goal. Now we are we are almost done. The last, next thing we do is delete the collision file objects out of here. Because we don't want this in here. We don't need them in here. I mean, you don't, honestly. And now we're going to save this. And it's still goal area file, so we'll click OK. Now, the reason we named these is so that we can check which specific one was, was hit. And we'll show you that in here in a second. I catch up in the tutorial because I've gone through this so much. All right. Now, we've declared them in there, but in order to detect if we've actually hit them with the puck, we're going to want to create objects for them. So that's what we're going to do right now. Let's go ahead and right-click here and add objects. Notice where I clicked. In the game screens, right-click on objects. Now we're going to go from file, from the goal area file. Grab the source name, should be left goal, and the name, left goal. And we're going to do the same thing with the right goal. Notice I am not putting any spaces in these names, by the way. Do not put spaces in the names. It'll, it, it really can't do it anyways because they're variables. All right. Now we have our left goal and our right goal. Now we can add that to the collision. So let's go back over here to the files. Yep, it's fine. Reload. We're still in the game screen. Now we need to add first. Let's have the players bounce off of the goals. Huh? Player ball list. I, body, collide against bounce, goal area file. We're going to have the player have a zero. We're going to give the goal area file one and then one elasticity. Remember, that keeps the goal area goals from moving while it bounces the player back. Next, we need to add the puck bouncing off of the goals. But when we do that, we want to detect them. We're not just going to bounce off of them. We want to detect that they did. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to come down here and we're going to create an if. If puck instance body collide against. We're not doing collide against bounce. We're not doing collide against move. We're just colliding against because once it hits the goal, we want to take the score and reset the player field. So that's what we're going to do. If it's the left goal, 
then we're going to assign goal to team index of zero. Now that's a function that doesn't exist. We will have to create that here in just a moment. But let's do this one here. If puck instance body collide collide against right goal assign goal to team one. Now with that said and done, we are going to make the assign goal to team method right down here. Private void assign goal to team manager team index. So this will accept the team index and assign the value to the team. Now we can do this through an if statement or a series of if statements, but it's actually probably better to use a switch statement, and that's what we're going to use right now. Case zero. And up, oh, I forgot to do that. Scroll up. We're going to create some score variables up here. Integer m score for team zero equals zero. We're all initializing them to zero as well. Integer m score for team one equals zero. Now let's go back down. M score for team zero plus plus break. Case one. M score for team one increment. Break. Now we're going to add a default just in case anything happens to go wrong. Doo -doo. Team index must be either zero or one. Break. Right below this, we're going to want to reset all the positions because at this point we know that they've gotten a goal. So let's reset all the positions back to where it goes. All positions and states. So now let's define that function private void. Now we're going to, once again, we're going to write in bad practice and then we're going to come back and clean it up. Okay. So player, we want to set the player ball instance back to its original position. So its original position is where it's X is equal to 10 player ball instance Y equals to zero. And we also want to change its speed and velocity, its velocity and acceleration because it, we got to stop it. You know, it might be, he might be moving. So velocity, and this is a vector three. So we're going to set it to vector three, zero. I'm going to do the same thing for acceleration. Now we want to do this for player two as well. So I'll just copy and paste here. And then just add the twos. Isn't that awesome? All right. Now, last thing we need to move and reset is the puck instance. Instance dot y equals zero, and we want to change its velocity as well. There. Now, as I said, this is bad practice. You don't want to repeat yourself in the code. It's called the dry principle. Uh, don't repeat yourself, literally. So we're going to dry up our code, and in order to do this, we're going to replace some of this. So here, let me show you what we're doing. We're going to come up here. And we've got some values under game screen. We're going to come in here and grab the player ball instance. We're going to right click on it and go to edit reset variables. Now we want to set reset the position variable. Now this is an existing variable on the object. You're not creating a, a variable here. And we're going to do this for player ball instance too. And even though the tutorial doesn't say it, I'm going to do this for the puck instance as well. Oops. Let's 
because I spelled it wrong. P O S I T I O N. Seriously? Position. There we go. If you spell it wrong, it'll throw an error because it doesn't exist. All right. So now we've got the position variable set there. The next thing we want to do is we want to actually use them. All right. So that's what we're going to do is we're going to come back to the code right in here. We're going to remove these here. We don't need, we're going to remove that. We're going to remove this because that's what we're replacing right there. So player ball instance dot position equals player ball position reset. We're going to do that for player two as well. Player ball instance two position equals player ball instant position to reset. And do this for the puck instance as well. Puck instance position equals puck instance position reset. So that's fewer lines to do the same thing. So now if the puck goes out of bounds, it'll hit the side of the screen and be reset back to where they started at originally. So next, we want to start working on scoring. So we're going to add a scoring HUD to the game. The scoring HUD is going to be in 2D. So we're going to come over here, scroll up, add a new entity. We're going to call this scoring HUD. And we're going to leave that is 2D check this time. This time it is a 2D element. We're going to add four text items to this thing. Um, those four text items are going to be team blah score and team blah score label. Uh, the blah might be throwing you off, but here we go. We're going to add objects, scroll down to text, and change this to team one score, and keep doing this. Team two Score just happened to hit the caps clock key there. Team one score label. Team two score label. Now we want to set some default values for these. Now looking at the tutorial. The tutorial right now is wrong on one of the values. We're going to correct that as we go. But first off, team score, team one score label. We're going to change display text to team one colon. And we're going to change its X value to negative 205 and its Y value to 270. Then we're going to choose team two score label. Change its text value to team two colon. We're going to change its X value to 125, even though the tutorial currently says 180. And we're going to change its Y value to 270. And the reason I'm changing this to 125 instead of 180 is because the Team 2 score is also being put at 180. So this puts the, the, the label in front of it where it's supposed to be. I believe it was a typo on the tutorial, and that will be fixed, hopefully, before you see this. Then we're going to go to Team 1 Score. I'm going to assign 99 to the display text. The reason being is when you're designing the game, you want to assign the maximum number of, of the widest character to the display values so that when you're designing it, you can make sure you have enough room for those values to be displayed. Now, we'll override that later, but I'm going to set the X to negative 150, and that's, of course, to 270. Then last but not least, Team 2 score. Set the X to 180 and, of course, 270. Now, if we run the game now, we'll see we will not still will not see these. We need to add the scoring HUD to the game screen and put it on a 2D layer. So that's the first thing. Let's add it to the game screen. Yep. Now we need a new layer. So we're going to right click here and add object. I'm going to create a layer, and I'm going to call this HUD layer. I'm going to click OK. And because we're going to be showing 2D elements on this layer, come over here, make sure you still click on there, and change is to D to false. Now we have a 2D layer. Now let's add the scoring HUD instance to the layer. I'm going to click on it and drag it on top of the HUD layer. You don't see anything visually, but if you scroll down on this, you'll see that it's now on the HUD layer. 
let me catch up on my tutorial page over here because I think I just yep so now the next thing we want is we want to add the logic for the HUD so that we can actually keep track of the scores so we're gonna go to score HUD CS yes we are going to reload everything's there have been some major changes score HUD CS and we're gonna add some public properties right up the top now these are gonna be settable properties only public int score one set this team one score display text equals value not to string I want to do this again for score two team two score display text equals value to string Now, ReSharper is complaining, you know, that squiggly line you see under the value to string, it's because ReSharper is complaining about localizations. Uh, it's c cultures, essentially. I'm going to ignore it. Visual Studio does a fair good job of handling that for you. Now, now that we have that, we need to update the HUD itself. So we're going to come back down here to our game screen. And we're going to look for assign goal to team, which we was one of the last functions we wrote down there and we're going to add in this score HUD instance score one equals M score for team zero and do it again down here too scoring HUD instance score two equals M score for team one Now, the last thing we need to do is back in the scoring HUD, we need to add a new custom in thing to the custom initialize that says set initial score values. That's going to be a function, obviously. We're going to drop this down here. Private void set initial score values. I apparently didn't write it right, so there we go. And down here, score one equals zero, score two equals zero. That overrides the 99 that we left in there on in the design. Now, remember, you leave it in there on design so that you can make sure it's going to fit. Now, the last thing we want to do on this, because now we have scoring, the last thing we want to do is add a little bit more game playability and it, it doesn't have a whole lot of depth so the next thing we want to do is we're going to add some dashing to the game so that you can press a on your keyboard or on the xbox controller and jump forward so in player ball cs we're going to add a dash activity and to custom activity dash activity and then we're going to obviously create the function down below it private void dash activity and in here first we need to check to see if the button a on the xbox controller has been pressed so if m gamepad button pushed xbox 360 gamepad button a and if it has been pushed then we're going to do a little bit of magic works here float Speed equal M game pad left stick position length times dash speed. Now dash speed doesn't exist yet. We are going to create that here in a little bit. Uh, what we're doing is we're making it so that the speed that you dash at is based on how far over you have that thumbstick press. So if it's only pressed a little bit, you're only going to dash for. Uh, get some of the dash boost if it's pushed all the way then you're going to get all of the dash boost so double you know, double angle equals m game pad left stick dot angle so this will determine which way you're dashing x velocity equals float system math cosine of the angle times speed we're going to do this for the y velocity as well
This time, however, we're using sine. There was that. Now, next thing we need to do is add this dash speed to our game. So let's save everything here. Come back up here to the player ball and add the variable. Add variable. This is a new float called dash speed. Now, the value for this is going to be 30. Okay. Now, if you play it right now, you'll notice you can dash as often as you want. There is no time frame or anything to it. So we want to kind of slow that down. So back in here in the player ball instance, now we're going to add another variable. Double M last time dashed. I'm going to set this by default to a negative 1000 that we, we can pr guarantee that they're going to be able to dash right from the get-go. Now we're going to come down here to the dash activity and we're going to modify it ever so slightly. First thing we need to do is we need to check to see if it's time to dash. Flat red ball. Screens. Darn it. Screens. Screen manager. Can't type. Current screen. Pause adjusted second sense. Last time dashed and we want to see if that is over dash frequency which is another variable we're gonna to have to create here in just a second now what that is doing right there what we just did is it's checking the pause adjusted time for the current screen um, what pause adjusted means is if you minimize your screen flat red ball will automatically pause your game no activity is going to go on so let's say you just dashed and as soon as you hit that dash button you minimize your game and then you wait four seconds, reopen your game. Well, you still got to wait two seconds before you can dash again because nothing was occurring in the game. It was paused. So that's what pause adjusted does is it, it, it skips the pause time. It ignores it and counts on real on how long the game's actually been running. So now once that's done, we want to be able to set that time last time dash value. So we're going to do that right here. Last time dash equals, and I'm going to do this just to make it easier. So I ain't got to type all of it back out. Dot. Seriously? Dude. Pause adjusted current time. That's it. All right. Now, so that's that. Now we want to be able to see, oh, oh we've got to fix that dash frequency too. So let's go back in here, add the player ball, add the variable. Get a new variable it is a float dash frequency i'm going to set that to two that means that they can dash every two seconds now now they can't dash but only every two seconds but the player doesn't see that they don't know this so we're going to give them a way of visually knowing how long they have until they can dash so we're going to open up the player ball and since we're going to click here add another object we're going to add a circle and this time it's going to be called the cool down circle now this circle is going to be controlled by two different states so we're going to add those states right now we're going to add the first one is tired and the second state is rested easy enough Now, we need to have, we need to be able to adjust the radius of this cooldown circle. So we're going to add a variable here, tunnel to the cooldown circle's radius. As soon as I find it, then go. All right, so we are good on that. Next, we want to be able to use change. Hold on, let's go to states. One more thing we have to do. In the rest, and now that we have the cooldown circle radius, when you're rested, that value is going to be 1. But when you're tired, we want that value to be zero, all right? So that means when you're rested, the cooldown circle is at its largest. When you're tired, the cooldown circle is at its smallest. So what we're going to do now is we're going to drop into the code, and we're going to make it so that that value changes. So right in here inside dash activity, we're going to add a current state equals, and we're going to add that to tired. Then right after that, we're going to interpolate to the other state. Interpolate to state, 
variable state rested and we're going to make it take dash frequency that many seconds all right so what's going on what does interpolate to state mean what that means is it's going remember the values we set on the states the one and the zero um, the, as far as radius so it's going to slowly raise that number from zero to one over time span of two seconds and that is it as far as that goes so we're going to go ahead and play this and show you what it looks like now now we can move around i can press a to dash and everything is working just as it's supposed to be you see the cooldown circle is showing up on the screen now let's go ahead and test out the scoring if i can work that out just a little bit there we go hold on Now the team one just got one point, so there we go. Team one just got two points. So let's go add team two a point just to make sure that that's working. There you go. See, everything is working. We are good to go. And as I said, the player will bounce off of the goal and everything else so there you go there is beef ball the beef ball tutorial and it only took us a little over an hour <laughs> great job guys all right as always uh, that's going to be the end of this show as always a like a comment and a share it lets me know that you care and we'll see you in the next episode of coding with mages thank you so much for watching